We've had my Mark II Golf on the channel quite a bit recently since its fiery debut in episode 4. Oh, fire! So after the brake upgrades recently, the oil cooler, which maybe didn't go as well as it could have done, I thought it'd be nice to take a look back at how I ended up with the car. And not failing to get it to a track day. Well, yeah, that could have gone better. The Mark II Golf wasn't my first foray into working on cars, but it very much was the first one into doing serious work on cars. I'd done the usual kind of discs, pads, suspension, springs, but the Mark II was really my first foray into heavily modifying a car. This isn't even my first Golf. The first one that I got was in 2003 when I passed my test, and it was 58 raging horsepower of Mark III 8-valve goodness. And honestly, it was pretty slow. But I still did about 88,000 miles in that car in the time that I had it. And I really worked it pretty hard, but I did nothing to it. It was never modified, it survived all the way through the Max Power era, and it never had a single change made to it. I actually don't even have a full shot of it. This is the only one I could find in all of my time with the car, and it's a partial shot showing just a little bit the day I moved down south after university. So here's one that I found online, which is almost identical to the one that I had, if not absolutely identical but it probably has a little bit less rust than mine. In fact, this one in particular is insane. It's three and a half thousand pounds for a 1.8 CL Golf, which makes me wish I'd kept mine, although it'd probably be a, more of a pile of rust than the Thunderbird is. So the Mark II is my first foray into modifying cars, and I think I probably started way too far off the deep end for most people modifying a car. Doing a whole running gear swap from one car into another Probably not something you should start right out of the gate. However, I had two things in my favour. One, platform commonality, and two, Matt. Now, I've mentioned Matt a few times. He's helped me out a lot over the years with the Mark II, as well as the other projects that we've got going on at the moment. It was very, very convenient that he also had a swap ready to go from another car that was being torn apart, so all I needed to do was find a car to put it all in. Now I found my Mark II on eBay and it was an absolute poverty spec gem. No sunroof to leak, no electric windows, no radio in it. It was a four speed, 1.3 carburetted. As you can see, it is the most basic cars around, which is the best way to start with a project like this because I didn't have to remove all that much. I pulled the interior out in the first week, pulled the carpet up and then went over removing all of the goo off the floor that's used for sound deadening and sits underneath the carpet. And that's a really horrible chore, but you can chip away at it and then eventually just wipe over it with petrol in a well ventilated space, but you can wipe it away and it dissolves it and it comes up really nice and clean as you can see here. Now I paid £165 for this car with some light gravity assisted bonnet damage from where a paint can fell from about three storeys up. And you can see that in the dip on this photograph right across the bonnet. And that was an absolute steal for what is essentially a rust free car then, let alone now where you're looking at the thick end of about £1,000 for anything five door that runs and drives and doesn't have much rust. And if you want a three door without a sunroof, you're in multiple thousands of pounds. Now, in terms of donors for a VR6, you're really looking at one of two options. You've either got the Corrado or the Mark III Golf. And the Corrado has a 2.9 engine, and the Mark III Golf has a 2.8 engine. But now, both the Golfs and the Corrados are getting pretty thin on the ground in reasonable condition. You want something that's running, ideally, to start with, so you don't have to go fixing a bunch of other problems. And if you want a poor Corrado to start pulling apart, you're looking at least five to six thousand pounds on eBay. The Golfs are a little bit cheaper, they did make more of them, but that's still kind of the region you're looking in for something that is a known working unit, rather than finding something that's a complete basket case and been sitting around for who knows how long. Now the reason you want to start with one of those is because the commonality between the Mark II Golf, the Mark III Golf and the Corrado is fantastic. You can theoretically just unbolt the subframe and bolt it back on the other one. And as long as you've got the right year Golf from 1990 or later, you actually don't have to do an enormous amount of engine loom wiring back into the rest of the Mark II Golf platform. You do still need to do some and change a few bits around, but it's a lot simpler if you start with an after 1990 model like I did. One thing I love about the VR is the noise. With a really good exhaust on it, they just sound fantastic. Ah, 
I've not had mine at full chat on track for quite a long time, which is really disappointing. But hopefully we'll get there eventually. But it's not just about the weight of the car. The Mark III Golf and the Corrado both weigh sort of 1,200, 1,250 kilos thereabouts. Whereas the Mark I Golf and the Mark II Golf are sort of 750 to 950 kilos. But the engine within that, the VR6 engine with the gearbox on, weighs about 200 kilos. Compared to the 8-valve and 16-valve 4-pots that were in the GTI, all the way through the 1, 2 and the Mark III Golf, they weigh about 120 to 140 kilos. But it's even worse than that, because the VR6 leans forward in front of the axle, so the headlight basically has the engine right up behind it, and it's leaning right out over the front of the car, so it does make it a little bit understeery. You can fix that, however, with enough parts, time, and money, you can make it handle really, really nicely. Or you can just kind of steer into it and push it harder and put a limited slip diff in, which is what I've got, and it does really, really well. There's a joke about the Mark II and the Mark III Golf that if you take a Mark III and peel away all of the bodywork, underneath there is a pristine Mark II, and that's why they're about 300 kilos heavier than the Mark II Golf was. Unfortunately, it's not the case, because if it were, there'd probably be a lot more good condition Mark II Golfs kicking around on the road right now. So the car's been to the Nürburgring on, I think, six different occasions and probably done 30-ish laps, all told. Uh, been driven by half a dozen different people at this point. And it's really done very well. As I say, Ian managed 9 minutes 15 in it. My best is about the 9.40 mark, give or take. But he is a race driver and I'm not. So I'll give him that extra 25 seconds leeway, right? I've done a couple of other track days in the UK, down at Keevil. Uh, I've taken it down Santa Pod. That was the first time I ever went down a drag strip, was in my Mark II Golf, facing off against a Mark I Cabrio. And fortunately, I won, but I was on some terrible tyres. And they were really, really poor. But, despite spinning wheels most of the way through first gear, it was fine, and I got down, and on the way back, that's when one of the calipers let go on the rear and snapped the disc, but that's a story for another time. All told, that car's been really, really reliable. Right up until the crank position sensor went about three years ago and I started chasing various different bugs trying to fix that, it was really, really good. It dailied, I've done 20,000 miles in it, it was used to and from work as a commuter car, uh, it barely used discs and pads. I've actually been waiting to change the discs and pads on that car for about five years to get rid of the drilled rotors and put some bigger ones on now, which I have got. And the rotors I took off would probably still last for a while, but the hand-me-down pads, uh, <coughs> but the hand-me-down pads lasted reasonably well. And I don't think I ever put a brand new set of discs and pads on anything other than the rear when they rusted through badly enough that it failed an MOT. So if you want to put more engine into less car and drive around with a nice big boat anchor up front dragging you out to the outside of corners, where do you start? Well, first off, you're going to need an after-1990 Mark II Golf. That's with the CE wiring loom in, and that's what they carried over from the Mark II platform into the Mark III. So it makes wiring everything up way easier, mostly because you don't have to tear out the fuse box and basically start from scratch. Now, you can spot these fairly easily because they have the hazard switch on the top of the steering column rather than on the dash next to the radio. Depending on the Golf that you get, you're probably going to want to start with a new rear beam as well. You're going to have to get that from a GTI, so that'll give you discs rather than drums on the back, and you definitely want more braking force with this. If you're going to go wide track and pull the entire front subframe suspension and everything out of the Mark III or the Corrado and put it in, that will also give you five stud wheels. So you'll need to look for 5 by 100 wheels, not the 4 by 100s that are on every other Golf prior to the Mark IV, except for the GTI and the VR6 Mark III's. Now, a pretty safe bet is to use the BBS ones that came on the VR6, partially at least because they look excellent, or the Speedline ones that came on the Corrado. Both of them look fantastic, and there are still some good deals to be had kicking around on those. I bought some 16-inch RX2 BBS ones about six or seven years ago now with the plan to put some bigger brakes on, and I eventually got round to it. So I probably didn't need to buy those wheels about six years ago because it was a little bit premature. So if you want a boat anchor on wheels that makes some of the best noises around, you could do worse than start with a Golf and throw a much bigger engine into it. 
If there's anything else you want to know, drop a question in the comments below. I could do another video later. I've got all of the pictures I took when I was building the car up, so I could probably make one out of that and answer a few more questions on it as we go along. In the meantime, if you'd like to buy any hoodies, hats, mugs, t-shirts, or anything else, you can check us out at shop.pedalbox.show. And if you'd like to support us more directly, you can go to patreon.com slash pedalboxshow, and you can sponsor us from as little as a dollar a month. And we have been making good use of all of our patrons' donations so far, and we are incredibly thankful for everything that they've done. Weather permitting, we'll still be working on the cars and putting out as many of these videos as we can film over the winter months when it's a little bit dark and miserable outside. So we'll probably film a few more of these and go into things like the Thunderbird, the SD1 a bit more and do some more of the history on that. In the meantime, thanks for watching and we'll see you later. Yeah.